Welcome, everybody, and good morning. Very energized about this meeting, and it's part because the coffee is so good and strong. So I'm going to try not to talk as fast as a New Yorker, but all bets are off. My name is Jason Morrison. I serve as the head of the Seal Water Mandate. I'm very excited about today's 16th uh, annual working conference of the Seal Water Mandate. Really want to, I love this exercise, so I just want to go back in time a little bit and ask, is there anyone in the room that was at the first working conference in uh, Stockholm in 2008? Anyone that was in that room? How many people were at the working conference in, in Mumbai when we did the 17-hour uh, field trip in one day and launched the AWS? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's something to tell our kids about. Um, <laughs> literally six and a half hours each direction on a bus. Um, so 16 years on, the, 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 the landscape has progressed, uh, the stewardship community has matured and it's grown. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion uh, and uh, how we're uh, going to progress and, and really scale the work going forward. This is a really exciting time, I think, for the water stewardship community um, and the ideas that we have that are bold um, and not easy to do, but really uh, significantly stand to have impact at scale. And we're going to hear a lot about that. I want to, uh, before I get into an agenda review, I just want to thank our event hosts, uh, AB InBev and Ecolab. Thank you. Uh, these events are where we build the relationships that carry the work uh, throughout the year, and I just really appreciate your support uh, enabling this event. Um, and so let me go through this uh, agenda. So we're going to begin with collective action. The Seal Water Mandate has spent quite a bit of time uh, talking uh, about uh, collaborative action. We're going to um, my colleague uh, Emilio is before that going to say a few words about our CEO circle meeting that we had on Monday um, and some key takeaways from that meeting, but right into the discussion around collective action uh, and the work that's emerging uh, in, in our basins that are of focus. Um, we will then pivot to uh, talk about how we're accelerating that collaboration and informing that collaboration through uh, advancements in uh, data and AI vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Water Action Hub, which is our coordinating mechanism. We'll break for lunch. We come back and formally launch uh, the first working draft of our good practice guidelines on implementing NPWI, Net Positive Water Impact. And Greg will lead that discussion. Um, then we're going to pivot to uh, a strategy around scaling our work through uh, investments, in this case, the WRC investment portfolio, uh, and the opportunities that uh, each of you have to engage in, in that work. Uh, and then our last uh, session will focus on uh, the water uh, access and sanitation and hygiene uh, agenda th that we're advancing through WASH for Work um, and the opportunities through collective action and where that work is heading. We then have a uh, reception that is uh, hosted by Diageo and Water Aid. Very much looking forward to the opportunity to network with you all. Um, and I hope you'll all be able to stay toward the end of the day to do that. So. With that quick review, I'd like to invite uh, Emilio up to the stage. Uh, Ecolab uh, uh, and uh, Ecolab CEO, uh, Christoph Beck, is a co-chair of the CEO circle. So I wanted to see if we can get a few uh, words from Emilio on his takeaways from Monday's meeting. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Um, wow, where do I start? Uh, just to, to build on Jason's point, uh, we have Monday. We had a CEO circle, really networking and really progress event that was, uh, I think, really went well. And I, I know some of the members that were here, you know, I see Michael was there, Diageo. We had a number of organizations, AB, MBEV, uh, Alex is here somewhere. So one of the things I'd like to share are some of the reflections. And I, I think one big reflection is the ability from us to go from what was at one time a closed door CEO circle meeting with the leadership committee to a much broader uh, group of stakeholders coming together as members and opening that up to non-members as well as an opportunity to really drive recruitment. That has been a big thing for us and I think it's working. It's a great opportunity to really share more publicly and Sanjeev did a great job facilitating that session for us on Monday. I want to just give you just some uh, thoughts about what we took away from the meeting. First and foremost, there was what I'll call an emphasis at the very start around the business imperative for collective action. And we had series, 
We had um, our CEO, Christoph Beck, and a number of others that stepped up to reflect on why they're doing what they're doing. And it was really a compelling time to hear from them the fact that, you know, we're in this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit provocative here, folks, that the days are over where we're doing ESG for ESG's sake <laughs> and that, there's, that, that this is all about the business imperative to drive growth and also impact when it comes to the planet in a water-constrained world. That was a big message that came through at the very beginning. And then we moved to these three takeaways and objectives. One being that we want to encourage Basin champions. And we heard from some amazing success stories that are off the ground working in places like India with HCL Tech, with GAP, with GSK. We heard about California Ecolab. Christoph Beck spent some time talking about what is, what are we, how are things going after a year. So we had some incredible opportunities to share that. We now have a focus on 25 basins I, that we're working on out of the 100 priority basins that we identified. It's point number two, this, this, by the way, before we get to point number two, one of the things that came out of that discussion in my mind were three words, collaborate, prove, and move. And what I mean by that is if we're going to solve and get, take action around these basins, we need to collaborate, and we had a session just a little bit ago on this very topic, to, to say what does it take to collaborate, what does it take to get your leadership on board, and what does it take to really get out there and drive the necessary stakeholder engagement and the right projects, part of the proof, and then, of course, the most important part, we need to move because we, we, we need to accelerate action and drive scale. The, the second key point, overview on progress toward our 2030 roadmap. I thought Jason, Andre, and the team did a great job of communicating through a dashboard that we hopefully may see that will demonstrate the progress we made um, toward our 2030 goal, where we were, where we are today, and it was very impressive, to say, to say the least. Um, especially when you think of you know, the MPWI um, authoritative white paper that is coming out that is giving us an opportunity to really say, how are we doing, are we, are we moving the needle in the places that we need to around impact, collective, uh, nature-based solutions and collective action. Um, last point, because I'm going to get the hook from Jason here in a second. Last point, increasing WRC membership. So remember our goal, 150 companies and their supply chains to impacting a third of the freshwater use on the planet. We're really relevant. What we have here is a really relevant group that's going to help us get there, but we need more. And we don't need 1,000 more, okay? We're 38 now, I think. We need to get to 150. And so the question is, what's that incremental step to 50, to 100, and to 150 by 2030 to, to really drive that collective action we need to reach our goal by 2030? And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Jason. Thank you. The Seal Water Mandates team uh, has grown, and uh, there will be some folks that uh, you may not have met yet. I want to call attention to uh, an important member, new member of the team, George Schuler. I don't see you in the crowd here. There he is right in front of me, <laughs> who has joined us uh, uh, from uh, the Nature Conservancy, a long tenure there. Uh, he's based here in the U.S., but I do hope that you'll take the opportunity to meet George here. Also, if the name tag is a, a, a white tag, then that means it's a member of the, the Secretariat. So please do introduce yourself to team members uh, at the breaks when you have a chance. Uh, it, this is a collaborative uh, network and initiative. So I'm going to set the stage before I'm handing to the collective action team. Map of the world. The 100 basins. Are people familiar with how we landed in these 100 basins? A few words here. So in the lead up to last year's UN Water Conference in 2023, we worked with a number of practitioners in the space to look at where is it that there's a real opportunity for businesses to have impact by working together. This was an index that included things like where is water stress already pronounced? Where are the economically germane regions for the global economy? Where is climate change really likely to impact uh, the water systems in these areas? And where is there already work underway that we can build off of? And that's the 100 basins that we've landed on. There's an app within the Water Action Hub where you can see and place your sites and your sourcing regions within that. 
we now have Basin champions that have raised their hand to take a leadership role to help bring the collaboration together in a particular basin, to be the advocate for accelerated action, and to, to bring that relational capital to the story so that we can have uh, action that, that unfolds at speed. And we also now have uh, over 275 companies that have committed to taking action in these 100 basins through the water resilience target of forward, the Forward Faster Initiative of the UN Global Compact. And for those that are already signatory to Forward Faster, you will know that the commitment is about a resilient water resilient operations and supply chain, but also about working collectively with others to have positive water impact in 100 basins. So our numbers are growing. And importantly, the relationships with the country networks of the Global Compact are also growing. Some of you may uh, already know that the UN Global Compact is the largest uh, corporate sustainability network in the world with over 22,000 business members. And this connection through these local networks is an important conduit to reach the businesses that may not have a global reach, but certainly will care about water in that particular basin where they have operations or where it's a key market for them. So building these relationships has been very important. And uh, we're looking to build on that because I believe there's about 65 or 70 country networks overall throughout the Global Compact. So that's my tee up, and I believe I'm handing uh, to the collective action team to my right. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome those that join us uh, after AGM. Um, for those that join AGM, I'm going to have some couple slides that are the same. I'm not that creative, so bear with me. This should be. Um, a context um, that I would do for the uh, collaborative sessions, but the most important part will come after me when we're gonna start giving examples of how these are actually unfolding in different basins. Um, so to, to just start this, I mean, I know that it's nothing new for all of you that work in, the, in water, that we are seeing all these you know, extreme events in different parts of the world, but the questions in, uh, that we have today and it's uh, helping shape us the collaborative is not like, well, we know that it's a drought, but how much are we actually talking about? What is the size and what is the number that we need to understand in order to see if the solutions that we have today are actually being able to address this and also create game plans for what is solutions are we missing? What is the scale that is needed? And then uh, that basically means that we start need to put, you know, we need to put numbers in the, in, instead of just you know, these ugly photographs. But, so that moving forward, that means that we need to start to start understanding um, a thing like this model. I know it's a complicated graphic, but you know, if you are familiar now probably with climate change models, this is exactly how it's represented, right? When you have, like, unfortunately, those, those red bars, which is basically where we're going, and we're trying to get to the blue bars. It's basically like, well, this is a resilient basin. This is the place we can live. There's water for everyone. And, but in order to do that, there are some you know, actions needed. And it's basically uh, what we're gonna be talking about, how we're gonna find those different interventions that will move us from the red bar to the blue bar. Sorry, not bar, line. Um, and that basically means uh, doing things like you're seeing this table as a quick example. Now, if you're at a 0.5% shortfall supply demand, and there's a projection for 20%, we know this is what is our target, right? Well, we need to prevent that 20% loss. And if we put a number to that, we know the, the, know the challenge ahead. We know what we need to do. And if there's technologies available that we can use to get there. So that basically means, in a, in a summarized version of that graphic, using um, Mississippi as example, don't mind it. It's a simple target, right? We, we are still uh, doing an exercise with our friends at Liminotech to get the, the specific numbers. But if you, if you think about uh, a basin like Mississippi, and you're currently at a D, which is a very challenging situation, what we want is getting an A, right? So it's like, well, how we move from D to A, it's what we're trying to, you know, to find out right here, which, which is basically the quantifiable gap that we need to close. So as an example for you, like moving to D to A could be recharge one million cubic meters of groundwater by 24. Doesn't mean that we, are we going to do this all alone? No, this is the point of, of what we're trying to do, is create something that aggregates the companies, aggregate the different players implementing solutions, and can also bring the public sector to conversation so we can establish also more public-private partnerships and advance the work. And that will lead us to getting an A. And no, so that basically means that 
some of these questions needs to be answered, right? Right now, um, we do have a challenge about like, what is the total size impact compared to the size of the challenge? I mean, if I pick it up, all the good work that you no know, WWF is doing, TNC is doing, that their companies are doing through their bilateral partnerships and aggregate these numbers. How much of that, of that, for example, groundwater recharge when uh, I'm solving, like it's, I'm solving 1% of the problem, 10% of the problem. That actually helps me understand what is the effort that we need to make moving forward, the collective effort. And, um, then, and then answering the, the upcoming two questions, like how much we need to scale and what are the solutions that will get us there. So this is basically, like in any company, creates a game plan for us to respond to, you know, what is the strategy, how much is gonna cost, how long it will take to get us there. And these are the things that right now we cannot answer, but this is what we're looking for by establishing this collaborative and start having these answers for multiple places and you'll see examples of how we're advancing this uh, in at least uh, three examples today from Mississippi, California, and Godavari in India, but there are more to come. And, and that also, um, you know, the suggestion of establishing this collaborative is also reinforced by a work that was led by, by WWF, but also you know, a lot of people in the room contributed to AWS, WaterAid, uh, TNCs, and, and other, uh, uh, other partners, but also companies like you know, Diageo was there. It's basically like, what, what, what is the challenges we're facing and why this, this collaborative can be a model that can help us? Because you know, what we're seeing is that there's no coordination sometimes between stakeholders. We know that people are doing things in the basins, but they're not talking to each other. And sometimes we're missing a link. So how do we find all these players and how we find all the missing links? So basically, that basically helps us you know, with the second question, like who else is in the basin doing what? Because if we're you know, trying to do collective action and not knowing who is in there, how am I supposed to, to connect those players? How am I supposed to tell companies like, well, have you know, do you know this solution? Can you come up with and play with us? Um, the other challenge is like, it's a, it's a lack of a common direction. You know, I know that you know, the companies have their, in, their individual targets, but what we're missing to kind of put people together is like, what is the common direction to put the companies together with the implementers, together with the public sector and everyone going in the same direction? And that basically is our understanding like, well, we need targets. We need to you know, build a narrative that gives you like, what, is, what we're trying to achieve in this basin. And that will be, you know, make all these different works make sense and aggregate them to a common direction. And, and that you know, will then help us with the two uh, last points, which one's like, right now we have like a, a lot of small scale projects. And small scale projects are high cost because usually these companies are, in, are investing individually. So there's no economy of scale, there's no potential for leverage fundings for public sectors or other organizations. But uh, by transitioning this into collective action, then oh, this is becomes something known, something that we can you know, bring to, uh, to a public sector discussion, to foundations, and also like, well, this is the work we're doing. Can you help us move forward? And the, other, and the last point is like the, the lack of standard metrics and reporting system. So you know, sometimes the companies have their information that the, from the bilateral project, they report in the SCG report, but, but like using standard, you know, different metrics, some are using like you know, VWBA, some are using their own methodology, some are not quantifying the project in this way, and now how, can we're able to do what, you know, what's happening there if we cannot connect the dots, if we cannot aggregate the, you know, the impacts. And that basically leads to um, what we're talking here today, the collaborative, and I'm not gonna go to all the details, but it's basically like we create a strategy to solve everything that I just, that I just mentioned, all those challenges by you know, playing neutral party, by creating the target, by putting people together. Um, in, in a summary, you know, what we're trying to do is kind of like, uh, when I mentioned aggregating all this up, it's considering that you know, we know that there's a lot happening and there's oh, more to do, but in the place that's like recognizing that we need to work with, you know, to make a difference, there's gonna be nature-based solutions are needed, but also washing initiatives, gray infrastructure, and of course the companies need to do their part by improving their efficiencies and continue their operations. And all this will happen at, small, you know, at smaller scales. And when someone says like, well, maybe Hydro Shed 4, when you talk full Mississippi, it's, it's, it's a big scale. It is not for a, for a target, it's not for a narrative. But if you're looking for a site-specific approach, an efficiency project, or an NBS, yes, you need to deep dive this into a smaller scale for more information. But that information is also critical to be aggregated up so we know exactly like what we're trying to achieve together. Um, and that basically means that you know, we move on to the sub-basin and catchment, like well, what is the aggregation of the impacts coming from collective action, bilateral action, unilateral actions? And this is what, um, 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 it was alluded by when I mentioned like, oh, this is the WRC dashboard. What we're doing in the dashboard is aggregating all this information and say like, this is what we can achieve together. And that basically means the collaborative is an aggregator. It's someone that can, can put a target for the full basin and bring all the players together. And, uh, and of course, if we're using everyone speaking the same language, we can do this for country level and you can do this for global level. And global level, we mean, is our, um, our common target. The one that we set up for WRC, but it's also now part of Forefaster, is like achieving 100. Uh, positive impact in 100 basins. 
And this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, all I, I have for you guys. No, I'm not. Uh, so the other important point, the last point, because Jason already uh, mentioned this and show you a nice map, is we need champions. You know, we need people that can actually help us do that. Because we know that initi the initial undertaking of setting those targets, of creating the narrative, or, or, and bringing people together for the first set of collective actions, it, it is depending on leading companies, on those that raise their hand and say, like, well, I'm, I'm willing to help because this is an important basin for us. And you can see good examples of companies that already raised their hand. And you're going to see the plus ones. These are companies that are almost there. So it's like, well, no, about to announce. Unfortunately, we couldn't announce it today, but we're, no, probably in the upcoming weeks, we'll have more champions. And this is the movement that needs to grow. We need more companies that follow these good examples. And you'll hear directly from some of them right after me. Uh, so this is why I'm stopping talking and bringing Catherine that will introduce you our Bayesian collaborative case studies. With that, thank you all. chair didn't go down. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, where'd that go? Here we go. Um, over the past year, uh, a little bit more than a year, actually, we have, we've been learning um, and iterating and refining. This morning, we're learning that we're continuing to learn um, about this model and its key elements that position it to be this collaborative, to be an optimal mechanism for scaling collective actions. And these eight activities on the screen, um, really summarizing what Andre just talked about, represent the infrastructure we believe um, and have started to really observe to be the critical uh, infrastructure for driving meaningful impact, this positive water impact in these basins, while respecting local hydrology, stakeholder dynamics, um, the, the existing efforts that are going on the, in the basins, and maintaining a focus on the long-term outcomes um, and that, that achievement of targets. And so what we get to do today, uh, now in this next session, let's see, it's gonna progress to, to highlight um, how some of these key elements are coming together in practice uh, across a couple of basin regions. Um, we do recognize that different basins are gonna have different flavors, different variations of what this list looks like in practice, but we are gonna hear from some corporate basin champions um, and basin partners who are gonna share their experiences around primarily what is highlighted in blue there, these central elements of the collaborative list, the baseline conditions, establishing those, um, setting corporate targets, and creating a roadmap of solutions for corporate investment opportunities. Um, let's see, so there, uh, Andre already alluded to these, but we have three case studies, Mississippi River Basin, California, and then Priority India Basins, including the Godavari. Um, you can see their respective topics on the screen, and I'm gonna go ahead and invite up our five speakers, still three case studies, but five speakers, um, to the front to join me, if, if you can. <laughs> um, and while they're coming up, I will introduce them in turn, but while they're coming up, I'll go ahead and suggest to please hold your questions. We don't actually have a Q&A session uh, immediately part of this session, but lunch does follow, so remember who these speakers are. Um, please hold those questions and, and go talk with them afterwards. I, I know they're very passionate about the work they're doing and would love to speak further. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Yes. Did I get the number wrong? Oh, Emilio. <laughs> what are you missing? Where'd you go? <laughs> lost my mind. Okay. All right, so we're gonna kick off with the Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi case study. We have Tim Decker here, CEO of Limnotech, and Kim Lutz, uh, from uh, Executive Director of America's Watershed Initiative. They, uh, Kim and Tim, <laughs> Kim and Tim, uh, represent two of the lead management organizations in the establishment of the Mississippi River Water Action Collaborative, where their teams are working in real time um, to establish that standard baseline diagnostic and set corporate water targets in alignment. This was brought up earlier uh, with existing and new um, public sector goals in the basin. So Tim, I'm gonna invite you first um, to share more about Limnotech's approach, completing that baseline diagnostic, um, how that's connecting to setting corporate contribution targets. Um, and then I'm gonna mention too, there's a particular emphasis on community engagement and environmental justice in this collaborative's ethos, um, thanks to the leadership of our Basin Champion there, 3M. And we'll also have Tim share a little bit more of the work plan around that EJ element. All right, do you have the clicker? Yes, please. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I'm look for, looking forward to talking about the Mississippi River Basin and the Mississippi River Water Action Collaborative. And so I'm, I'm gonna do a, a very quick 10-minute uh, summary of a, a yeah, fairly substantial process that we're going through in setting up uh, the collaborative. Um, it's, a, it's a big watershed. It's actually a big collection of watersheds. There's, there are five different sub-basins within the Mississippi. Um, the total area that you see on the, the slide that, that's in the front there is about uh, 1.2 million square miles. I'm looking to Kim to see if I've got that number in the, in the right general ballpark. I do. Um, five different basins, very different characteristics to those basins. A lot of work going on by many different parties, federal, um, municipal entities, academic studies, many things going on, gathering the data, assembling the models and the tools that are needed to really understand what's going on, what the basin level priorities are, um, what kinds of goals would be appropriate within this, with, within this, uh, this, this complex piece of, of watershed uh, that covers so much of the U.S. Uh, however, um, you know, the actions that are being taken aren't necessarily leading to coordinated uh, basin-wide resilience or incentivizing corporate uh, level contributions. That's the big challenge here is taking all that, all that body of work, which is so important and needs to be honored and respected, translating it down to something that's really crystal clear uh, for corporates to be able to say, yes, that's something that I can understand, that I want to invest in, that I want to, you know, put, put effort towards and have the confidence um, that that investment will make a difference in, in the basin. So we think there's a lot of potential here to unlock scaling opportunities, um, to engage, to align, to coordinate, and to leverage um, the whole set of stakeholders with corporate involvement uh, within, within the watershed. So how to do that? Um, the first steps are, um, as Catherine said earlier, a, a subset of those eight steps that are common to all of the different collaboratives. Um, these are the middle, the central parts, establishing a baseline uh, basin condition, mapping the key actors, and then beginning to set those goals, understanding how to map them to the, the, the full range of goals that are, that are out there to things that we can really, really get to work on. And then, yeah, special part about the, the MRWAC, um, we're establishing baseline goals, values, and methods for environmental justice. I don't know, is that the accepted terminology? I, I, guess, we just, I guess we just did it. Um, and uh, integrating environmental justice with water resiliency actions, really figuring out how the kind of technical picture of how we, how we really manage the basin as a whole or the goals within the basin as a whole with those environmental justice actions. So that'll be listening sessions and then thinking about the scalability of EJ actions. Um, so how do, we, how do we do that? How, how do we establish basin, uh, the baseline conditions? Well, as I said a moment ago, it's, it's high level basin diagnostics. It's respectfully understanding all the work that's been done. I think across our team, we have a lot of capabilities to, to understand that work that's been done. Uh, people on the team have been compiling data and information for a long time. Um, one important element of this is AWI's work, um, and Kim will, will speak about that more, but the, the ongoing report card process that, that provides information on the, the health of the watershed uh, along a few different dimensions. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, and then by applying Pacific Institute's basic basin diagnostic tool to, to better understand how those um, conditions will, will map to goals. So, and then the other part is understanding the corporate presence. What, what are the corporates that are active in the watershed, roles that they play, how might they fit into the, the baseline conditions that we currently understand, what are those, what are those impacts? So we end up with a, a, a technical foundation for setting goals uh, that address basin stressors. And then how do we set those goals? Uh, we're looking to develop specific, quantitative, again, crystal clear uh, corporate water-based goals to address the, the issues in the basin. Um, we see that as uh, a workshopping process, reviewing the, the many uh, existing efforts that are out there, um, and then getting to gaps, understanding how those can be not just understood narratively or, or qualitatively, but actually getting to quantitative measures of gaps uh, and then developing goals that are specific to corporate impacts, translating those to corporate, um, corporate actions that are possible, and then using an advisory group process to get feedback on that and make sure that we're all on the right track. So um, where do we want to be at the end of this process? We want to have a process that gets us to something that's specific, that's uh, catalytic, that is scalable, and that's collective. So those are, the, those are the overarching words that we have in our minds as we think about how to make this all work in the Mississippi. Um, one example of a North Star, I think many of you have seen this, and I think we'll talk about it a little bit later uh, as well, but um, the California Water Re Resilience Initiative is, is a great example of a North Star kind of goal. I mean, California has the example, or has the uh, advantage of um, having a very well-defined 
water supply gap that's been identified by the governor. This is, um, this is the North Star. Understanding that gap, understanding the role of corporates within that gap, and then taking actions to remedy that is a way to really align action in the watershed. So we're, um, we're looking to that as a great example of a North Star. Um, it's not all that they're about. California is also tracking multi-benefits. So um, in the CWR is, CWRI is thinking about reductions in pollutant load and also um, wash types of goals, increase in wash access. So those pieces exist as well, but they're really enabled by this, by this focus on uh, a high-level North Star type of goal. Um, in, the, in the Mississippi River, uh, as, as I said a moment ago, and as Kim will, will describe a little bit more in, in just a moment, um, there's a, a very complex set of goals. There are water quality goals as well, um, water supply issues, flood control, risk management issues, recreation, um, transportation and economy, and how the watershed facilitates those kinds of things. Um, AWI has been thinking about this for a long time and uh, has, has used the report card process to assess uh, progress toward that. And AWI is currently uh, translating the report card outcomes into goals that um, we hope our process will, will be able to turn into from narrative goals and qualitative goals into quantitative actions. So that's what we see as the next step um, towards that, that North Star. So, and then I want to make sure that we, we talk a little bit about th this other piece of the work. So, uh, environmental justice is uh, a big objective in the Mississippi River watershed. Um, 3M has really identified this as one of their, uh, their interests, something that they want to pursue and push and use the process of water-based goals to enable other kinds of, of uh, justice-based goals. So, we'd like to um, integrate these kinds of thoughts uh, into, uh, understand how they map across communities, develop a framework for community engagement that parallels the work that we're doing technically as we evaluate the basin, and then um, use that as a way to uh, elevate the leadership of the EJ community, give them a voice, and help them to have a say in what the next steps are going to be. So um, that's my quick overview, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and uh, maybe talk about the next steps. No, you could do the transition. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> I, I will be doing some transitions in between, too, though, um, just to string together the storyline. But Tim did introduce Kim beautifully, uh, your partner in, um, in the Mississippi River. Uh, Kim is, as I said, executive director of the America's Watershed Initiative. And AWI will be supporting the roadmap development activities in due time. Um, at this moment, I've actually invited Kim, or we've, we have Kim here, to speak to that process of setting the high-level um, goals among public sector and river basin partners. Again, I know this came up earlier, so a really exciting opportunity to see what happens, how can we bring together an existing set of more qualitative um, high-level goals with the, the quantitative corporate contribution targets that are coming together through the collaborative efforts. So, yes. Thanks, Kim. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get that slide on so you can see, again, the size of this basin. Uh, Tim gave the acreage. I'll give you another gee whiz figure. The Mississippi River Basin, by acreage, is the fourth largest watershed globally. It's also in the top ten for volume and river miles, so it's a big place. And one of the things that my organization, America's Watershed Initiative, started thinking about is why in the United States where there are basin initiatives in the Chesapeake Bay, the Everglades, <coughs> the Puget Sound, the Colorado Basin, why was there nothing for America's arguably largest, well, for sure largest and arguably most important both environmentally and economically to our nation? And so we set about to change that to say, how can we pull together a structure that will encompass all the basins, the existing work, federal, state, local, and corporate partners uh, to pay more attention to this important basin. So we started with the end goal in mind of how would we develop a cross-sector partnership that builds on existing initiatives. Every piece of the basin is organized differently by a variety of multi-state stakeholders. Some are all volunteer groups, some have gubernatorial appointees, so the structures are literally all over the map. So we thought, how can we bring them all together? <coughs> we wanted to do this collaboratively because another thing we know about the Mississippi River is the five basins have never worked together. 
They are doing great work independently, but have not really shared resources or uh, science. So we're really excited about bringing them all together to think about the benefits of a basin-wide structure around a set of goals. And I'll go back to those goals in just a moment. Another key player in this basin is our federal partnerships. And at the lead in these partnerships are the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They manage water resources in the U.S. and the department, <coughs> uh, excuse me, USDA, that really um, provides tons of money to this basin in particular because it is the breadbasket of our country. You can see the listing of all the other agencies that are involved, everything from groups that monitor the weather to monitor water resources, fish and wildlife resources, uh, et cetera. So it's really key to have those key players, the federal government, invested because you may know that the United States is putting an unprecedented amount of money into projects like the projects that you all would like to see happen in the basin. Nature-based solution projects, green and gray infrastructure, et cetera. So after a couple years of talking, because that's actually what it takes to bring together hundreds of, of leaders across a watershed of this scale, we felt we had the buy-in and the trust to bring people together to ask the question, what could we do together and what would that structure look like? We planned that meeting with a group of partners you see there and over 100 leaders from federal, state, and local government, national, <coughs> and local NGOs, and a handful of corporations. We hope that that is a metric that is changed in the future. We had a few folks from the um, <coughs> navigation industry and from agribusiness, and it was said multiple times, where are the corporate leaders in the room? We didn't have a focus on that, but now we have a place to focus and to center that. So we're really excited about having gotten the partnership to a certain point, but we really can't get it to go farther without you all uh, playing a key role in this partnership. During those uh, three days of meetings, we got together to really think about what would be different if we get a Mississippi River partnership in place? And we thought we'd have a lot better uh, opportunity to really look at multiple benefits, both from existing programs and projects and from future projects. We hope that that would lead to more efficient and effective spending. Data is another huge issue for our basin. There are hundreds of miles with no monitoring in terms of water quantity. That's a problem in a basin this big. So we need better data and better sharing of data. That was emphasized. And we wanted to really capitalize on the power of collaboration that is already happening and to amplify uh, the power of existing institutions. There's a lot of concern about how will this entity uh, subsume existing groups. We keep saying it won't. It will amplify them. And finally, what are the areas we've identified for collaboration? You saw several of these in our uh, existing, <coughs> excuse me, um, report card, but the areas that were co-selected by these 100 plus partners were water quality, flood and drought resilience, navigation and infrastructure, fish and wildlife resources, and recreation. We've got a starter set of goals and actions around those. We'll be refining them in the coming weeks. And it's really a nice uh, knitting together of having those starter goals and having uh, Limnotech be able to take those goals and really provide quantifiable targets to those. So it's a really nice uh, meshing of those um, of those initiatives. And again, uh, in closing, I'll just say we're very excited about uh, being a basin champion to help bring together all of the work we've done in the public sector with the private sector. So I look forward for, to the opportunity to work with many of you. Uh, and a year from now, I hope we have uh, much more to say about how we've engaged our corporate partners. Thank you. I'm going to give a quick plug also for the work the Mississippi is doing, this team is doing. So if you have the Mississippi as a location of interest and you're not on our mailing list yet, um, the deliverables that Kim and Tim just talked about are going to be coming out in first drafts over the next month. So please find me or our team and we can get you on that list. Um, Kim, uh, Kim, Tim alluded to the fact that California has a target. Uh, 
that exists already. So we're gonna take this forward. What happens once you have a target in place? There is one, we, we also suggested that there will be quality and access in the future, but this next case study is gonna start thinking about what's next. Um, what uh, Emilio Tenuta, the, so he, you heard from him earlier, but uh, our chief sustainability officer at Ecolab, uh, based in Champion, in California, it's gonna share what it's like to build momentum, right, around uh, an existing corporate target, um, and especially uh, something, a strategy that's satisfying both public and, and private interests in the basin. So I'll hand it over to you. Welcome to the Okay, I'm gonna go blind, I can't see the slides, but it's, we'll, we'll get there. So hi everyone again. It's uh, great to see you again and talk to you about, I'm gonna go, <laughs> okay. How about if I go over here? How about this? Okay, can we start again? Some, some musical chairs. I can see the slides. Um, so, we took flight in California a year ago. And what I'd like to do is just take a few seconds to go through where we are today, what progress we've made, and where we're going, as you heard. And so, what's great about this is that we talked about the priority basins, the 100 priority basins. We just heard about you know, the bread basket of the United States with the Mississippi River Basin. Now I'm gonna take you to the fruit and vegetable basket of the United States, right, in California. Number one economy in the US, obviously a big deal. I, I'm gonna just ask, from a operation, from a supply and suppliers and customers, is there anyone in the room that doesn't have touch those three areas today in California? Is anyone not operating in those three areas of dimensions in California? Okay, that's what I figured. That is, that's why we're together. That's why we're, this is so important for us. It's because this is obviously a very important watershed for all of us when you think about the criticality that California has as an economic powerhouse, but also extremely water stressed and has been for quite some time, where we have an opportunity more than ever, as you heard from Linotech, to align with the governor's plan in 2022, where he outlined that the that the science is telling us that climate change has impacted the fresh water supply and demand today and into 2040. And so that, that gap is 10%. And so the, it's, it's incumbent on us to then say, given the baseline, and as, as you heard, there's, a, there's quite a bit of data, we could determine where we are today and where we needed to go in order to contribute to that 10% that we want to support in our public-private partnerships that we need to scale in California. And so that is 1 million acre feet by 2030, which is that 16% of that 10%, and then 26%, which is about 1.6 million acre feet by 2040. That is the ambition. That's where we're headed. We have Limnotech actually working with us to quantify the progress we made after a year. And so we're excited to share that with you at our annual meeting, which I'll talk about in a moment. What has happened since we kicked this off in Sacramento in 2023? We actually had our CEO, Christoph Beck, who's the Basin Champion. By the way, General Mills, I can't believe I didn't share this with you already. General Mills is our co-lead in California as well. And so we're excited about that. We have a number of organizations that have jumped in. We'll share that with you in a second. But one of the things we wanted to do is to align the work that we're doing with the governor. And so Christoph Beck and Governor Newsom actually had a uh, virtual meeting uh, about th four months ago that really aligned the private sector's role in the state of California along the water plan. That was great because the governor really wants to see how the private sector can contribute and was wondering how that was going to come together. Now, we also met with the chair of the Water Control Board, Chair Esquivel. He came to our meeting to kick off the initiative. And we've had regular meetings thanks to the Pacific Institute, who, by the way, is our PMO for California. We also uh, work with Linotech, who's been an important resource partner to us, along with TNC and a number of others, to help support the work that we need to do around, well, really four areas. One our baseline, two, the ambition you just saw, three, the roadmap which we're going to release, uh, the, the roadmap that we developed over this past year at the Sacramento meeting in a month, 
And then finally, how we're going to measure our progress, which is something that the Pacific Institute and Limnotech are going to help us with along the way. Now, we've also, thanks to our friends at McKinsey, I know that's probably uh, another organization that we all have worked with in the past or, or currently, They're, they've agreed to present a study they, they worked together with all of us on, which is to understand the value of collective action in a place like California. And it goes back to my original question to this group. You know, we're all working in that area. What does it mean for us to really work together to drive the resilience and the growth that we need to see in the state to really meet the, the demands that we have in our business? So with that, I'll just uh, end with this final so slide, which is a shameless plug for the fact that we have our second annual meeting. And I'm, I'm going to look out there, Valerie Valentine, whose hand is up. She has uh, been kind enough to help us uh, bring this together. This is an important event because we're coming together after a year. These are the organizations that have joined, you know, the fight, if you will, to help us reach our ambition. It is a great opportunity for us to really uh, share not only the progress we've made, but also the roadmap that we developed along the way in terms of what we need to do to get there by 2030 and 2040. And then finally, we also want to make sure that we have an opportunity to bring Governor Newsom who we invited, by the way. Uh, the good news is he's asked for more information, his staff has. That's a positive sign, right? So it doesn't mean, a, doesn't mean no. So you know, it's a 15 minute walk from his office to the Sheraton where we're gonna be. So this is, you know, this is great. But we wanna bring together the governor, the water control board. By the way, the, the, and you're right about the, there's obviously a lot of complexity in the Mississippi River Basin. But think about this in California. What is it, 400 adjacent water districts in California or so? There's a lot of complexity there, folks. And so how do we bring together these different stakeholders on the public side in the water authorities to work with the private sector by seeding the projects that exist today, but also new ones that we don't have today, and including Cheryl, uh, you know, I'm looking at Cheryl Hicks out there, uh, some of the investments that we need to make in areas like balance sheet capital to also drive replenishment projects in the Central Valley because we know how important agriculture is to the state. So with that, I'm gonna yield the rest of my time to someone. <laughs> to my friend, Michael Alexander. Thanks, Emilio. Okay, and we're gonna move for our last case study from the US over to, <laughs> over to India. Um, both the Godavari, we'll hear uh, the, what's happening there, as well as across priority basins in India, um, and two of the visionaries behind the drive of the coordination and scaling up collective action solutions there are with us today. I'm going to start with Michael Alexander, Global Head of Environment at Diageo, uh, Diageo being one of our two basin champions in the Godavari alongside GSK. And Michael's going to take more of a fireside chat approach, I think, today. So, uh, no, I'm happy to. Yes, excellent. Um, but we're going to um, start with a little prompt here. So what, we, what we've asked Michael to really speak to is the fact that um, Diageo has helped to set in motion um, an upper Godavari multi-stakeholder governance structure uh, in, in the sub-basin there. So specifically, excited to hear about, from your perspective, that gap that you identified, Michael, the Diageo identified in the upper Godavari that warranted the need for for a governance and coordination uh, body like this initiative, and particularly uh, the outcomes that you and your company, Viaggio, are, are seeing or expecting to see that make this investment in more of an enabling uh, infrastructure, I'd say, worthwhile, um, despite it perhaps not immediately generating the traditional volumetric water benefits um, or KPIs that we're used to seeing. So a little bit about why, why are you doing what you're doing, Michael? <laughs> Here, you do have one slide. Yeah, I've only got one slide, guys, so um, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to listen. Um, and thank you, thank you, Catherine. So yeah, from the global north to the global south, uh, things happen a bit different in the global south, and I feel a little bit of an imposter because I'm from the global north. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm very happy to share some, some of our experience. And I'm not gonna take you through the detail of the Godavari Initiative, because I think actually I'm probably more valuable to share my thoughts and my perspectives and some learnings uh, thematically, which are more appropriate to all collective actions, perhaps, or those corporates that are thinking about heading in the direction that we headed in the Godavari. So I'm going to talk about the what, uh, the how, uh, uh, sorry, the why, the what, and the how. So why are we doing it? 
Uh, Diageo has got uh, 150 manufacturing sites, 40 of them in more distress sites across 12 countries. A third of our volume is manufactured in uh, more distress sites, and uh, we have a big climate risk associated with water. Right. So that's the why. Uh, the the why is also that we have four targets on water: 2030 targets, ESG targets. Uh, the normal ones around efficiency and replenishment and, importantly, wash. But the fourth target that perhaps many don't have is we have a single target on collective action. We say that we will be engaging in collective action in 12 priority basins by 2030. And everybody knows that's a corporate in this room knows that if you have a target, you get attention. And so the one recommendation that I come from this, those that are thinking about refreshing their uh, water strategies at the moment, set a collective action target, right? It's not complicated. Just wherever your priority basins are, set the target, and that gets you the attention, the scorecard, the KPI, the indicators, the assurance, the risk assessments, and all the budget you want. So uh, <laughs> set, set that target. So why Godavari? Godavari, we have two distilleries. We have an important business in India. Uh, the Godavari uh, that we focused on, uh, well, sorry, I should say we set back one second. We have a partnership with TNC, particularly the Nature for Water facility, which uh, is going around scoping where we need to find opportunities for collective action in those 12 priority basins, right? Now, the good news is that TNC are an excellent partner. The bad news is there's not a lot of collection action going on in those basins where we want it to have collective action. So it was okay in Kenya, where we're basin champions, where the TNC had a water fund there, and we're very much involved in that water fund in the Upper Tana, again, in one of the 100 basins. In uh, Mexico, where we're also basin champion in Guadalajara, in Jalisco, in the Santiago Loma Basin, we were very pleased to take on the mantle from ABI, who started a collective action there called Chaka Medito, that now has 12 basins, 12, sorry, 12 corporate members. So that's brilliant. India, uh-oh. We will look at the upper Godavari, uh, where we have those two distilleries. Uh, it's a, uh, a Godavari, for anybody who knows, is in mid-India. It's the second largest river. It's about 108, no, sorry, about 1,800 kilometers long. So too big for us to take on on our own. So we wanted to segment that and look at uh, the upper Godavari, which is about uh, maybe 55,000 square kilometers. And that's where our distilleries were, and that's where we thought we had to focus. So this isn't... We're going where the risk is, right, where our distilleries are, and that's important. So uh, we created this. Um, we, we did the scoping with TNC. Uh-oh. Lots and lots and lots of fantastic projects, which I think Joe has mapped lots of, and you'll hear about in a second, maybe. Huh? But more importantly, no collective action, no single point of focus for businesses to uh, collaborate together. What do we do? Mm. Well, I would describe ourselves as reluctant conveners. We don't want to be doing it. We don't particularly think it's appropriate for us to be doing it. But we stepped out and we decided we're going to do it because in the absence of anything else, to be completely honest with you. So we've created a Cadavery initiative. That is a two-year program, and it has created a project management unit based in Mumbai. It has five employees. It has a website. It has a LinkedIn account. It has everything set up within seconds. And I have to say, and again, I'm a bit of an imposter, but for those of you who've worked in India, when you give a task to your teams in India, they go at pace, and they get things done. And that is hugely inspiring and hugely rewarding for us to see just the pace they go at and the actions and the uh, achievements they can achieve very quickly. Sometimes I think we've got an awful lot to learn from the pace that they can deliver. It's not perfect, absolutely not perfect, but that is uh, not needed. We don't want perfection, we just want action. So we've created this Godavi initiative, and we kicked it off uh, with a meeting Actually, with the initial meeting was with GSK, which was fantastic. GSK provided a supplier meeting, and um, Jason and others were at the meeting, and that was a great way in which to kick it off. Uh, and after that, uh, we held a, uh, a meeting at the end of August where we formally established the Godavari Initiative, which is where you see the, 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 the photograph now of the, of the participants in that. And since then, we also had a, another meeting in Nashik. For those who know that part of the world, Nashik is a kind of uh, source of the Godavari, if you like, and is a very uh, kind of focused area for industry as well. So lots of members there. To give you a feel for who was there, there was not only just uh, government, local and state and, uh, and uh, regional government, but also uh, NGOs. Uh, there were uh, civil society there, and there were a lot of companies there as well, which was fantastic. To name a few, GSK, obviously, Mondelez, Colgate, Bayer, Heineken, Capgemini, Hinduja, ITC. They were all there at this meeting. That's them all there. Um, they were at this meeting, right? So this was fantastic. This shows that we're picked somewhere that we think that there is a, a real kind of grassroots need for collective action and collaboration, and I think it was a, a, it was a, a fantastic start. Since then, in Nashik, importantly for us, we've now signed up three industry associations representing over 5,000 SMEs, 
Not, I'm not mentioning in this room about SMEs, but they're the ones that are doing stuff on the ground. Those are the ones that can actually really get the scale we need across the whole of the collective action. And I should say the ultimate outcome of this is for us to exit after two years of this project management unit, to hand it over to the collective action, to build a business plan and action plan, not just across nature-based solutions, but across policy engagement, across capability building, across other areas in which we create infrastructure, other areas which can really inspire uh, action and a collective approach to driving change in that basin, right? There's a hydroshed level five basin, and it's uh, essential for us to mitigate our climate risk. We are going to have to get that action on the ground. We won't do it through replenishment or efficiency or anything else. We will only mitigate our climate risk by helping that whole basin adapt to climate by doing it through collective action. And that's a clear message to our, our top uh, of our business because that's why we volunteered for the three basins to be basin champions. So a couple of thoughts on on it, more generic them thematic thoughts on, on, on the, I suppose, on the how. It's tough, right? So it, 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 is, it is very tough. It takes time, uh, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of organization, and as I said earlier, it's, we're reluctant conveners for what is described as the thankless task of just funding a project management office, right? No replenishment volume, no improved efficiencies, no kind of targets hit on that respect. It's all about that convening of a collective action, a multi-dimensional collective action, not a collective action just delivering nature-based solutions, but a collective action that can, that can engage with government to change policy, that can engage with government to increase investment, that can look at trying to collaborate with banks and other financial institutions to get further uh, funding to scale it up. And that's the point of this collective action. So it is tough. It is a bit of a thankless task, to be honest with you. And I question, and it's a question for discussion, I question really, should businesses be doing this? My own view is no, but in the absence of anything else, we've done it, and we'll do it elsewhere if we need to. But the bigger picture here, and it's not about us, it's about the bigger picture, is how can WRC, how can other uh, institutions and organizations and NGOs and banks and everything else bang heads together to create that opportunity so that businesses do not have to fill the gap? Because I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for businesses to be filling that gap. We're not the trusted convener. <laughs> There's a lot of people that don't trust businesses. but. We will fill the gap where we need to, but the bigger picture here is how can we get the WRC, this great group of people, to work together with all our uh, contacts and networks to really drive that kind of change that we need to at that level of the, of the basin. Uh, and a 100 Basin Initiative is very, very welcome on that account. So I would say, uh, the, other thing, the other thing I'd say about learning is funding. Of course, we all talk about funding. And I speak to people from the World Bank or from GEF or GIZ, and I say, oh, I've got some money. I've got some money I can give you. I've got some money for you. So why can't we as a group pull that money in some way to look at a more system, st systematic way in which we are getting the funding rather than individually and inefficiently and probably ignorantly from our point of view because that's not our core business is trying to find funding. Uh, how can we not better work together with our partners to get that funding? And that applies not just in the Gaddafi but anywhere. So it encourages us to kind of look at those different solutions because at the moment it is tough and it's not working efficiently. And there's one thing that annoys us is inefficiency. So just to conclude, um, Thank you uh, for GSK for being co-champions. Thank you for AWS and the WRC for helping us with the, uh, with the, and the frameworking of this of the Gadavri Initiative. Uh, it is hugely important to have that global framework in there, uh, and it is hugely important for us to make sure we learn from others in collective actions, and hopefully by sharing our views today, and it's just one, one perspective and one basin, but it's uh, something that we're very passionate about. Uh, and finally, I would just say, join. Join, just just uh, it might not be the Godavari, it might not, it might be one of the one of the hundred basins, or it might be other basins. A lot of our twelve priority basins are not one of the hundred, but we're still doing collective action. Don't feel limited by the hundred basins particularly, but focus on that if you can. But just join and do act, and don't let uh, don't let perfection be the enemy of action. So thank you for listening, and hopefully some of the thoughts are, are helpful. All right, I know we're running against the clock here. Um, but finally, I am very pleased to introduce Joe Fernandez. As Michael said, um, running at pace, I have been running behind Joe for the past year now, full speed. So WRC and Joe's organization, IIT, IIT, which he'll briefly introduce in a moment, cross paths around that collaborative activity of building a portfolio of solutions. Um, finding his organization already working on that and creating a standard process for mapping and curating and tracking solutions that make them easily implementable by multiple donors. Um, so we're 
have Joe here today to explain uh, his unique Solutions Up approach in the Godavari as well as other basins in India. Um, some, I, I know you asked me to say this too, so I will. <laughs> so we are, we're gonna hear him speak especially about uh, the criteria, the curation criteria that's being used right now, seeing as successful uh, with the Solutions Up approach and that we are also seeing aligning with standards like the volumetric water benefit accounting and, and other project se selection criteria globally. So excited for you to speak to that, um, as well as a complementary role to basin champion work, which is the basin leader work, and how we're seeing that designed in India right now to sponsor more solution infrastructure in basins. All right, with that, Joe, thanks very much. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be here uh, to represent this solutions model. Uh, in partnership with the CO Water Mandate and the WRC goals. Uh, first, just introducing ourselves. So the IITs are the premier institutes in India. We are alumni from the IITs who set up the foundation six years ago. Uh, and our goal is to influence India's transformation with a solution-based model. And uh, that's me out there and my, my co-founder, Karthik. Karthik, if you can just raise your hand. That's Karthik there. We're both here today. And that is me, by the way. Uh, those, uh, that's my look during my McKinsey consulting days. Um, uh, and uh, what we want to talk about today is a solution-based approach to solve for water. And I think there's two words specifically missing there that should be there, which is a collective action solution-based approach to solve for water. Uh, and that's what we've started to work on in design and it's turned out to be very powerful. So partnering with the WRC and the Sea Water Mandate, we've picked 18 river basins that are part of the Large 100 uh, for solution-based collective action. And you see there the Ganga, the Yamuna, and a few adjacent basins. We see the Godavari, including the Godavari Upper. We have three basins in the Krishna, and we have five river basins in the Kaveri and adjacent. And why we've picked these basins, not just that they're critical in the upstream areas of these larger basins, but because of the opportunity to drive collective action via corporates. So we are speaking to 75 corporates who are either already engaged in a solutions approach, who are members of the WRC, who are interested to engage in the solutions approach, or who have shown an interest who are not members. And it speaks to what Emilio said. We see this as a way to bring in more basin champions through, uh, through the process of basin leaders is where they can start. And these are 350 operating locations. Each operating location can represent about 2,000 square kilometers. So we're looking at a huge coverage of collective action from solutions that these 75 corporations can, can show us in these shortlisted basins. So what is the criteria to be a collective action solution? And so we've curated this along with the WRC. Firstly, the measurability, again, using the standards that exist today for both outputs, so that what are we really delivering, and then the outcomes that those outputs deliver in ways that are verifiable, that we can verify that this has actually happened, and that can be adopted in a standardized way by each corporation. So the beauty of this is each corporation can work with their solutions independently, but the collective action narrative automatically emerges as multiple corporations work on the same solutions. Uh, and so that's the solution-based model. It complements uh, what we're trying to do with the basin champion approach. Uh, it augments, it aligns. And so that's why we see uh, it as a very powerful add-on to what already is designed through the basin champion model. So where we right now is we've codified nine collective action solutions and how have we picked these? We filtered them based on one, they've proven that they can deliver community benefits, there is water savings and there is verifiable output outcome. Our ability to codify codification is critical for the collective action to emerge and then they're relevant to our basins. We're also adding more basins, so water aids, women plus water is something that we're working with them to codify. We have TNC doing a lot of nature-based solutions in the in the Nirabhima, the Krishna Basin, and we're looking to bring that into the mix. We have WWF doing river-based solutions, we're looking to bring that in the mix, and there are many more. So this is, nine is just a start that can be added on. So let's take you through an example of what is a solution, rejuvenation of water bodies. So that's a drill down into India, right? And what you're seeing there in blue are the water bodies. There are 20 million of these in India. There's about three for every village in India. And that's what it would look like if it was performing well. These water bodies capture the water, they recharge the ground, and you see the connectors, they cascade it downstream. And so they capture the water wherever it exists and recharge the ground. But what's the problem is that they're not performing. And I'm gonna point out the ones in red, which are the truly underperforming ones, right? And so these are, these are not working today. If I visualize a system without them, that's what it looks like. It's a broken system. 
uh, the, the water doesn't reach these water bodies because the network that brings it to them is dead. And so the real value of rejuvenation of water bodies is to fix the red, to bring all of this back to blue, largely. And it's a very, very simple solution. There are farmers who traditionally took silt, and now we engage them, to take silt. That's a silted up water body. They're taking the silt from the water body, and they're taking it to their farmlands, and they're improving the fertility of their farmlands, as well as silt helps them use less water. So there's a double whammy from a simple solution through collectives of farmers who do this. And we're looking at a huge scale of this impact. So let's look at some examples of how this happens for a corporation. The corporation first, around their operations, picks an area of intent. They design that, and that becomes the starting point. With that, using technology, we figure out an engagement scope of the highest stressed areas where these water bodies need to be rejuvenated. Then we work with the community who then confirms the lighter greens there. They confirm their interest to engage, and they commit 70 to 80% of the budget. So they are coming in and saying, we want to do this, and they're bringing in most of the money. And then finally, you run the operations, and then you start to measure the outputs, and you create maturity that kind of feeds back to the system. So what does this look like when you start driving this? This is a silted up water body, and this is when the water fills up after you desilt it, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? This is another silted up body. You see the temple out there? This is built around a temple, and that's the water when it fills up after desilting, right? And that's a third example. You can see all the grass and bush, but that's when the water fills up. And I'm giving you a fourth example, and that's a silted up water body. Again, looks just like, you know, uh, shrubland, but that's when water fills up. And the beauty is that the nearby wells fills up, wash improves, we have fallow land being repurposed, farmer incomes go up 50% or more. So you have a win-win-win where the community is now owning this whole process. So here's the potential for collective action. And so the AOI model, this is what you just showed us, Michael. These are corporations and these are their locations. And all of these can adopt rejuvenation of water bodies just around where they're located. And if you just add that up, you're covering most of the upper Godavari with a very, very powerful solution. And so the technology is designed to allow that to happen. And we've created this role that complements what the Basin Champion does. So the Basin Champion sets the overall context of project management. But a Basin leader who focuses on solutions just complements this with a bottom-up solution-based approach. So what do they do? Firstly, they just adopt it in their AOIs. And these AOIs can be anywhere in these 18 basins. Wherever they have operating presence, they adopt solutions. And they create momentum for that solution. And then the second, they resource. It's a small resourcing that allows us to set goals for those solutions, reach out to the other corporations, set output and outcome tracking, and set metrics for a solution up, very quick, very tangible, quick delivery of outputs that brings people together on the same page. And that's the only two things that Basin leaders can do. The beauty is that they can step up to be Basin champions once they see that momentum growing. And so you see the complementary nature, but it also delivers immediate impact, immediate. Within three months, six months, you're seeing actual outcomes on the ground for water. So here's where we are. With our 75 corporates, we've had great progress. There's huge excitement and interest. We're hoping to sign up Basin Leaders by December this year. We're going to work with them from Jan to March next year to really clarify the solutions they want for their prioritized basins, reach out to the other corporations to sign them up, create their own plans for solutions for 25, and then set goals and targets, but at a solution level that can be rolled out. And then deliver from uh, March onwards or April onwards, but also include some international accounting companies from Jan onwards so that we have a first year of real outcomes that are building momentum, a solution-based approach. Uh, and so just a quick call out, we are happy to build solution models anywhere. It, it, we've learned what it takes to curate solutions. It isn't that straightforward, and, and we know that there's great progress. This complements and aligns to what you're already trying to do. So talk to us, and we're happy to spend time. Um, I had a great meeting with investors in the space. There's $250 billion chasing risk in the space. And they talk about urgency. They say, if something works, we can't rebuild it elsewhere. We've got to take it there quickly. And that's what we're hoping to do with many of you in partnership through a solutions-based collective action model. Thank you. Thank you all. I hope you found that inspiring. This is that difference in metrics where we go from like, how many companies are we to like, this is action on the ground that's happening. I think the other thing that's really important is, this was, we heard from three basins. There's 11 that are moving right now. So as we look at two years from now, we're talking 11, 15 basins, all with similar stories about setting goals and, and having action. Um, they're also building credibility to this process, which I think is hugely important as we scale across 100 basins. 
So with that, there's tons of things to aggregate here, and uh, our next session is around AI um, data and the Water Action Hub, as that has been identified as something that we need as, as a baseline to help with the storytelling. So with that, Todd Player, Digital Technology Lead uh, for the Mandate and the WRC. One moment. Oh, there we go. Uh, I invite up to the stage with me uh, Tice Pierenboom from uh, 52 Impact to join me for a little fireside chat. We're going to talk AI and technology, all the, the fun stuff that is in the news today. AI consumes so much of it, and we're going to go a low-tech approach here and just, uh, just talk our way through it. So I'm excited today to bring Tice to the stage uh, to also be able to tell you about a partnership that we've uh, developed to advance this work uh, with uh, his company, 52 Impact. He's the chief technology officer. I appreciate you being here on such short notice as, as well uh, and the team making you available, but also our Water Resilience Coalition uh, member, Microsoft, uh, and the European Space Agency to really advance uh, some things around data, how we can monitor uh, river basins for health and, and progress uh, and, and move this forward, and along with uh, some support from uh, Ecolab and thank Emilio and the team uh, there for for their uh, support as well. I want to, uh, I have one slide uh, which uh, I'll follow um, Michael's uh, lead on this, which is uh, an image provided by Issa of, of a lake in Kazakhstan uh, to really emphasize the uh, importance and the use of satellite imaging as we scale across uh, 100 priority basins. It's, it's a big geography. But also a shout out to uh, a lot of you here that have contributed to some of the work that we've been doing around shared metrics. It's, it's really hard for us to begin to measure impact and monitor impact unless we can agree on what it is that we're actually kind of monitoring. And so we've, we've circulated uh, and worked with a group of uh, folks in this, uh, in this room as well as beyond this room around that. And I'm hopeful in the next uh, quarter that we'll have a list of these metrics and we can all begin to collect them and measure them in the different ways that we do in the different geographies that, that we work in and then report those up to uh, something, you know me, I'm the Water Action Hub guy, report it up to a system like the Water Action Hub so we can really democratize some of this data and make it available. But there's also this idea of you know, different uh, scopes. Where are we working? Are we working at a site level, a catchment level, and, and are we monitoring for progress at the, uh, at the basin level? And this idea of a local data set versus a global data set. So Thais, I wanna come to you and just ask you, you know, your thoughts about uh, the importance of local data and global data and uh, how that global data can lead to local insights. Thanks, uh, thanks, Todd. Thanks for inviting us. We've been working with multiple people in this room uh, over the last years at Fifth Impact. Um, and I think what we heard in the last hour and a half already underlines why well, we are sitting here together to discuss data and AI. The skill at which we're working is enormous. I actually never saw the Mississippi Basins combined overlaid on the US map. I was quite shocked uh, that it's that large. And we're talking about thousands of sub-basins, thousands of catchments that require local interventions to, in the end, actually scale towards well, basin level information. And what we see is that at 15 Impact, we start off with a global risk screening. So we want to prioritize where do you need to take action. And you do not do that on a basin level. You go to like hydro sheds level six, seven, eight to really know what are we, well, what are we going to do locally? And what we see is that measuring locally actually informs global models in the end. And there is a problem here uh, that I want to address today and also come back to it at the end of this session. There are data gaps. So we see dwindling supply of money from governments to, let's say, water boards and other measuring institutions uh, over the last years. So I think here there's a lot, of, lot to win, actually, to well, collectively act, take action and measure in our projects. But I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, great. So, I mean, you know, we're working on a basin monitoring platform to really begin to understand how uh, the actions that we might take collectively that have been talked about in the last session are, are really going to uh, create impact for us and, and, and help us monitor that, that long-term basin uh, health. In step one for us within the mandate as we think about the, the process here is a, is a basin diagnostic to understand what are the conditions in this basin that we're starting from? What are the shared water challenges? So that if we aligned to those shared water challenges that we're actually creating the impact in the basin that, that we want and not just taking on uh, random projects. So Tyson, I'm wondering if you can uh, speak to the importance of the basin diagnostic and how it helps you to know the impact that you're creating. Yes, perfect question. I think um, we heard about basin diagnostics before today. Um, and a data-driven approach sometimes is a bit different from sending people into the field. And I think there's a, uh, a huge win when you, use, for instance, use spatial data like we do that is actually globally available. Um, that is open to everybody, so it actually helps you in getting, uh, um, well, you can confirm your field work, for instance. Um, and I think the baseline is, in my opinion, the most important to actually see 
your own activity, so what we call the anthropogenic activity, what your, what your intervention actually contributed versus what would have happened if you did not do it. So we're talking about scenario modeling, um, see what your impact w can be, closing the gap as we already heard before. Um, well, you have to know what happened in the last 40 years. And I think for that, we can do, uh, let's say, field work right now. We started a project, we say this is what's happening. But with satellite data, with climate models, with meteo information, we can go back, let's say, 40 years and really make a very strong baseline and see where we go ahead. Uh, with I think what Andre showed is the climate models with the different, uh, the different pathways. Where are we uh, right now? We already changed from the business uh, as usual scenario, actually changed last year. Um, I think that's something to keep in mind. So where are we on track? For sure, for sure. And I'm proud to say, actually, Tim referenced it in his uh, remarks about the, uh, the Mississippi. Uh, step one is that basin diagnostic, and uh, we in the mandate uh, had a working group as, as well as uh, took input from a lot of folks in this room and our Water Resilience Coalition members and the broader corporate water stewardship community around a basin diagnostic template. Same idea, that we could establish a framework by which we would conduct a basin diagnostic, help create that shared understanding of what conditions in, in basins are, and we're going to publish it freely to anyone with an interest through the Water Action Hub, and the first five of those will be available for the Mississippi uh, coming uh, late this year, and as we uh, continue our work in the Godavari, uh, we'll have one for the Upper Godavari very soon after that, and moving out into other basins. So uh, uh, Water Action Hub will be the repository for some of this, and, and we really do want to, uh, to push that, that out there. And so after that, you know, we switched to basin monitoring. It's kind of the next step, knowing your impact. Uh, working together with uh, the European Space Agency, as I mentioned, uh, the Water Resilience Coalition, uh, th there was some pilot projects that we did to really understand how we could advance uh, the use of space technologies and things like that. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell, uh, tell us a little bit about the types of satellite data that are used in the context of water, how it can be applied to, to projects uh, and basin monitoring more broadly. Yeah, so we were actually one of the companies that were involved in it in the ESA project together with our partner ELEAF. Um, and I think it's important here to, well, first state, we have to combine all of this information. So information that can be derived from satellite data about water quantity, water quality, wash is a little bit more difficult as you can imagine, um, but also climate change models. So given satellite data, I'm not, not sure how familiar people in the room are with satellite data, but I think there are three big main sources that are very interesting. Those are the, the optical satellite sources, so we really can monitor with open data up to 10 meter resolution the entire globe, which is a European Space Agency satellite, Sentinel-2. Um, they have one big drawback. If it's cloudy, and it, well, they <laughs> some of the priority basins are very cloudy, let's say they're in Chile, or somewhere in the tropical zone, we can only measure maybe every two months there's one image. Um, so we complement that with radar uh, satellite data, which actually penetrates the clouds, but you don't get a, a nice photograph, as you've shown here on the screen. Um, but it can definitely complement and, for instance, help us assess what our uh, quantity availability and irrigation efficiency. And I think thirdly, and we are also now looking in, uh, in collaborating in that, is uh, the GRACE data, which is actually a measurement of the, uh, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. And some aquifers are so large, as for instance, the ones in our California, that they actually move around the, uh, the Earth's gravity, sorry, I said magnetic, I meant the gravity field. The gravity field is being influenced by the amount of water that's under the ground. So it's a very regional scale, let's say 200 by 200 kilometer information pixels. Um, but we have also been uh, looking into ways to actually or uh, upsample that so we get more, more local data, but especially, let's say, the Mississippi uh, basin that can really benefit from this, this type of data. Yeah, I don't know about everybody here, if you know about the GRACE uh, satellite, when I was first uh, looking into this around this idea of measuring groundwater from a, a satellite, uh, I was uh, sincerely impressed with uh, NASA's uh, capabilities there for sure. Let's switch gears. We've talked a lot about data and different things like that. AI was in the title of this uh, presentation, and I'm sure everybody's kind of wondering about how AI applies to corporate water stewardship, and, and uh, it seems to be prevalent in almost everything that is on uh, TV or any sort of media these days. Um, you know, we have our, our Water Action Hub digital tools, the ecosystem of tools that some of you have heard me talk about, and one of it includes uh, our Nature-Based Solutions Benefits Explorer tool uh, that we've recently kicked off stage three of our, our work with you on that around, uh, you know, using artificial intelligence to, to model NBS projects to understand what is the benefit accrual, maybe in a specific location, or where can I site it within a, a basin to have the, the most optimal impact, or if I have a specific uh, site that I, I want to use, what's the best uh, NBS project I could do there for uh, a benefit? So. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we're using AI in that work and how it can be applied to other water stewardship projects like that. Yep. Yep. So we're in the joining forces now to, to actually make the nature-based solutions benefits explore tool more well, spatial, I would say, that you can actually not only look at a country level, but within country, maybe subcatchments. Um, and there's a lot of 
information that's going into that. So there are a lot of global data sets available. Um, and where AI is there applicable, there are many options to, to mention here. But for instance, having a database of 20 years of land cover and land cover change really helps in determining where, for instance, uh, agriculture came up, where deforestation took place, where uh, there's urban scroll, sprawl, so actually cities are larger. Um, we have just seen uh, the example of Joe with 20,000 water bodies in India. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. The scale we're talking about is incredible. And we have in our, our in-house developed uh, water quality models, for instance, that are fully AI-based, where we can, well, first qualitatively, but also quantitatively track uh, water quality. Um, we, for instance, uh, trained this on millions of data points within the Netherlands, and this is also well one of the calls to, of, to action to measure, uh, to share any water quality measurements. Um, we're looking into collaborating on that uh, with the UN, uh, and I think there are, uh, there's a lot to gain. Yeah, I mean, AI really is critical now in terms of understanding changing basin conditions. Uh, what's the projected future state? Uh, so we think about creating things like digital twins of, of basins to understand what the gaps are. Andre had a slide up here earlier that talked about potentially 20% uh, supply demand gap. But to be able to understand what that looks like in 30 or 50 years based on certain uh, modeling criteria that we put in, like projected economic growth or population change. And we're working on a WASH model right now that we've actually advanced the work, and I I'll hope we'll have it available later this year, that looks at how do we pick predict the percentage of people that are going to have access in a given basin based on different criteria, like like I just mentioned, projected economic growth. What is the, the freshwater supply? All kinds of other elements. What, what's the governance situation in these basins? We know all those things impact uh, WASH, and so how do we create an AI model out of that using that and then train it using existing JMP data to say, yes, we, we have a model that, that accurately reflects what those numbers are going to look like. Um, so, Tice, I mean, that's a little bit about like AI, and I don't want to get too technical uh, on everybody here, but, but what are some of the types of AI models that we can use, and, and how are they applied to help us kind of understand these things? Uh, I think you almost already answered your, your own question <laughs> with all the, the, the nice examples you gave. Um, and I think there, there are a couple that are very interesting to the audience here. So you have, of course, kind of the standard machine learning, deep learning models, uh, where deep learning needs a lot of input data and also a lot of like training data, again, call to action. Um, well, machine learning can, for instance, more well, cluster information. So where do we see similar uh, regions? Where could we apply similar solutions? Um, I think the ones that are very interesting here and related to what you mentioned is, for instance, hydrological modeling, where uh, there's a huge AI component. So there's a lot of weather data going there, climate data, but also the ones about population growth, about economical growth that can really, um, th th we if we want to combine, combine all of these different sources, then you really should go to a deep learning metric. And I think one is important is um, kind of an early warning system, right? So if I, I saw somewhere like yearly updates, um, but a lot of companies here, they want, for instance, in-season updates for their, their fields, their farms. Uh, and then you like, uh, you want to combine predictive uh, meteo data, for instance, with all the historical data. I hope that was not too technical. No, that sounds great to me. All kinds of data. I love it. So um, we're coming to the end of our time here. And uh, so I think we've got time for probably one last uh, uh, question. So uh, hyperspectral satellites, as it comes up on, on calls with Tyson and I, and, and uh, we we're chatting about these uh, future satellites that ESA will, will launch in the coming years and, and what that means for our ability to measure and understand new things from satellite data. But it got me to thinking, uh, you know, from your perspective, uh, what do you see as the future of digital and, and space technology for water stewardship? Yeah, I think ne new satellites are are being developed. I'm not sure if the European Space Agency is in the in the room here, but there, uh, I think, in a year or two or two to three, there will be amazing uh, data opportunities. They're called hyperspectral data. So um, we measure in a lot of reflectance bands. That means that we can very precisely determine water quality much better than we can do nowadays, and also have much better insight in vegetation and crop status. So that's all very important, for instance, for irrigation efficiency. Related to that, at the same time, there will be a satellite that's launched uh, that actually measures the temperature of the Earth. It's being done by an American satellite right now, but this one will be more precise and actually be in the, in the well, it will be actually in the future. Uh, it will sustain for a longer time. So I think here there are a lot of advances. That means that there will be a lot of data, of course. And here AI is really the, the, well, the worker, so to say. There, It's really going to chunk all this data. So just a, a very technical outlook is, um, is for instance, quantum computing. Uh, ESA and NASA, they're both investing in, in doing this. This is probably too technical. Um, I think one, and I, I mentioned we have zero minutes on the counter um, and zero seconds. But I'm, I, I promise you to come back to this. So I think we have data and AI. That was the topic of this talk. But I just want to mention that data and AI, they're not the silver bullets we're looking for. Data and AI, they're not going to replenish water. They're not going to make your, your watershed more healthy. That's something we have to do. But 
to actually know what we're doing and to know uh, what our impact is, we need these better models. And that's where this data, uh, that's where this big data need is. And we heard already from my colleagues on there, do we as companies have to do this or do we, well, trust the government to do that? We see that what I already mentioned, dwindling supplies. I think if everybody who's implementing some kind of nature-based solution here or some kind of dam or, or uh, other local solution and share their results and share their local measurements now so that we can build the models to actually scale that solution later on. I think that, that would be my call to action. Excellent, and final call to action for me. This will all be available on the Water Action Hub. It's all free of charge. If you're not on the Water Action Hub, go to wateractionhub.org, sign up. Uh, as I mentioned, it's free. Get your company uh, on there, your organization on there so that you're prepared to take advantage of this stuff when it uh, starts hitting the ground, which we look forward to getting some of this out there in, in uh, early 2025. Uh, so with that, I know we're getting on towards lunch. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, uh, Catherine Iseff, to introduce our next speaker. And thank you, Taj, for making the trip. I really appreciate all the insights today. Thanks so much, Joe. thanks. Thank you. All right, so indeed we are very close to lunch. This is final food for thought, a little appetizer as we go into the meals. Um, throughout the discussion today, we've mentioned the importance of aligning um, and involving public sector stakeholders. So uh, honored today to have Mayor Melissa Logan with us to provide her perspective on the relevance of what all we've been talking about, the collaborative model, um, the use of data within the context of modern public sector sustainability agendas. I have a little bio to introduce you, if you give me a, a moment. <laughs> okay, nice, nice to meet you as well. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> mayor Logan was elected mayor of Blytheville, Arkansas in November 2022. The first female and only the second African American elected to this office in the city's 100 year history. She is a former human resource director, mayor's assistant, former election coordinator, small business owner, and adjunct instructor at Arkansas Northeastern College. Mayor Logan is also a 16 and a half year decorated army veteran, served in Desert Storm and Operations Iraqi and Enduring Freedom. People are her business. Moreover, the city of Blytheville is her business. She is diligently working with the city council and administrative staff on a five year strategic plan moving forward with tearing down dilapidated housing, rebuilding infrastructure, creating green spaces, tackling plastic pollution, and creating safe spaces for all families to live, work, and play. So thank you so much for being with us today and looking forward to you. Yeah, have at it. <laughs> Is it afternoon? Good afternoon, everyone. I have been all over New York City, and so I'm confused as to day and time. Um, <laughs> But I'm excited to be here. Are you guys excited to be here? Yeah. It's lunchtime, you're tired, and I'm not going to bore you with the semantics on today. Um, I just came to kind of um, give you an overview of what small city life is like. Um, sometimes uh, we lose perspective of the whole world when we only deal with compartmentalized issues. But I'm here today to represent an organization called MRCTI. What we are is an organization of mayors. We are a coalition of 105 mayors along the Mississippi River Basin Corridor. Um, our mayors span from Minnesota all the way to New Orleans. And um, last week we were together in Baton Rouge for our annual conference. And just to see the camaraderie and the uh, collaboration for cities as many as 800,000 to cities as small as 100 people, um, it's important. Right? Because what affects one affects us all, and the health of the Mississippi River affects the world. So I'm excited to be engaged in an organization that cares about one of the third largest river basins in the world, which is the Mississippi River Basin. And so um, to tell you a little bit, bit about MRCTI, it's our mission to conserve our water, to make sure that we have clean water, um, to make sure that we have a waterway that we can deploy resources and commodities um, to the rest of the world. And the health of the river really affects what happens in the economy, the food economy especially, because we know that when the water is low and we are in a three-year low, that the barges cannot move up, inside, up, up and down the Mississippi River. It affects the river grain, right? Because we are a large exporter of corn, of soybean, um, of cotton even, and I am a part of a Mississippi County area, and we are the largest steel producing community in the world. Um, we are home to Nucor, Nucor Yamada Steel, Big River Steel, 
U.S. Steel, High Bar, Atlas Tube. And so American Steel is what we do in my area of the country. So we need the river. And the water is life. And I was listening as the speakers were presenting. And um, I remember a song that I learned um, some years ago called the, uh, the Humbling River. And there was a, um, a prose, a stanza in that song that says, a whole lot more than riches and muscle, the hands of many must join as one. And together, it says we'll cross the river. But I would like to change some of those lyrics. Together, we'll sustain the river. We'll make the river more resilient. And we'll make the river lasting for generations to come. We cannot afford to lose the integrity of our river. So what MRCTI has done is um, as a mayor organization, we have partnered with Global Conservation, Conservation Authority, Ducks Unlimited. And what Ducks Unlimited has done for MRCTI, they said we'll come along as a partner to deploy your natural resources. And uh, we right now we are in the process of deploying 100,000 acres of wetlands to absorb when it's wet, and to release when it's dry. Um, we're also partners with the Army Corps of Engineers, and um, we have many other partners um, that I would like to uh, uh, recognize at this time. We are uh, partners with Two Degree Adapt, Adapt, Cargill, One Architecture, and a lot of others. And more recently, in our annual meeting um, last week in Baton Rouge, I found out that India has come on board. And so I was really excited to hear um, about all the uh, progress you guys are making and all the innovation over in India. We signed an agreement to share back best practices with some of your rivers. And um, we're hoping that that treaty that we've signed, that agreement that we've signed with you, will put us in, in discussions with other rivers because we know what happens on the Amazon, although the Amazon doesn't directly affect the Mississippi River, it does. Um, we can learn how do they save their river, right? Plastic pollutions is a problem, you guys. It's a problem. It's a problem because our rivers dump into our oceans and we know that water is life. And so we have to do a better job of conserving and protecting our rivers um, for years to come. And so um, as we're activating wetlands, as we're coming together collectively to devise a plan, he used the word um, that really made me think and I wrote it down. He said he missed two words, collective action. That's important because without one another, we can never make a change, right? I'm, I'm good by myself, but together we are better, right? And we are stronger. And because I'm a military girl, I know that we can build cities in days because that's what we do in the army. So how about let's save the river? Can we do that? Can we make a collective ac action group that says that we won't keep repeating the same cycle? We won't operate in silos, but to collectively together, all the organizations that make Climate Week successful together, I think that we can save our rivers. And so um, look out for Mississippi River cities and towns because we are coming to a city near you. We're coming to a conference near you because we want to be heard. And uh, we are going to be talking to Brazil and China and Colombia. And we just signed with India. And so we are relevant. You guys, we are here. And uh, y'all can tell by my voice, I make a lot of noise. I am an extreme extrovert. I like to get work done, and um, just because I'm from a city of 15,000 doesn't mean I speak for millions. And so today I'm here to speak for millions of us along the Mississippi just to say, please join MRCTI as we try to do our best to save our river. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Logan. And uh, it's so inspiring uh, to see networks forming in all sorts of different ways. The seal water mandate, of course, being one network around corporate water stewardship. And to see the opportunities to collaborate with networks within the public sector is truly inspiring and, and exciting. I don't know how many corporate water stewardship initiatives we've said wh where the questions asked rhetorically, where's the public sector in this conversation, right? That's something that we've talked about. And if you just listen to today's uh, conversation, you see all of these really interesting ways where the work that we're doing around collective action and corporate water stewardship is now starting to connect to public policy and to the public sector. So I'm going to use that as a segue uh, to talk about uh, another form of convergence. And a number of organizations in this space uh, have been working together for many years, but we keep hearing the call to, to bring this together, bring this uh, collaboration into a way that is uh, more structured, and that makes it easier for companies that are leading, but also for the learners that are joining, so that there is coherence in the space. And so I would like to invite uh, Adrian Sim up with the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Uh, we have been working 
with the Alliance for Water Stewardship for many years, since the AWS inception, in fact. The seal water mandate was on the board of directors at the outset of the initiative. And that partnership has deepened, uh, and it has also in now formalized. Uh, and so what we have done uh, recently is develop a, a MOU that we're going to sign here today before we go to lunch. Uh, and what this MOU is doing is not only putting together uh, the high-level vision of what we hope to achieve together, but couple that with annual detailed work plans of really how are we going to operationalize these uh, collaborative efforts in the area to come. And it's around um, of improving our influence and our voice in ways that are aligned, sharing information, and joining hands in the geographies where we're looking to have impact together with our respective networks. So I would like to call up Adrian, see if you have a few words, and uh, and then after that we can sign two versions of this document. Look at that, BYOP, you brought your own pen. Excellent. All right then, Adrian, over to you. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, the question is whether it works, because I do everything on, a, on one of these tablets these days. Um, yeah, look, Jason's, Jason's outlined why this is important. Um, this is uh, something which is the result of an evolution over many years. In fact, AWS was, was first conceived in your office, Jason, I believe, back in 2008. The idea of an Alliance for Water Stewardship was uh, was born in Oakland. Um, so it's it's been a relationship which has been very close all along. Jason has, has said that the mandate was on our board when we had organizations uh, um, uh, like the mandate on our board for the purposes of developing the standard. We launched that standard uh, in draft form, as Jason mentioned earlier on, in Mumbai in um, 2013, I believe. And yes, I was there waiting on you all to come back from that field trip, <laughs> getting progressively more anxious as the hours ticked past. Uh, but somehow we, we, we got to the point where we also launched the standard at the meeting of the mandate in, in Lima. So this, this relationship is, is not new but uh, for formalizing it in, in the way we're doing today and communicating that we are working in lockstep to make your lives easier. Those of you who want to understand how to engage in water stewardship or how to take that water stewardship um, to the next step, to engage in collective action in the places that we've been talking about today, uh, we're doing this very much as, uh, as part of a, a coherent ecosystem and this is an important step along that journey. So thank you, Jason and everyone in the mandate from all of us at AWS for your collaboration. So the trick here is we've got to both squeeze on this podium so we can get the picture yep. taken at the same time. This is the okay. stewardship uh, in practice. All right. Left-handers, they get in the way. <laughs> Great. Do you have anything else to say before we uh, break for lunch? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you.